Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to give a brief introduction um, about the program and to, first of all, thank Dr. Um, Kaplan for all the time he put in getting this off the ground. I really appreciate it. We love how he looks at the museum and um, drawing the expertise of our wonderful faculty and other in the community. So we're really excited about this. So I'm Hani Farbid. I'm the chair of the psychology program in the adult bachelor's program. And I just wanted to let you know that it's an undergraduate program sort of designed for um, non-traditional students that really focuses on applied psychology and social and psychology for social justice. So whilst we offer a really great grounding in traditional psychological areas, we also really focus on applied and um, evolved contemporary issues in a challenging and evolving domain that we live in, um, and really bringing in kind of critical, intersectional, and contextualized theories and looking at um, different types of issues. We have a booklet here. I might just let Abu um, put that in the chat. Um, and if you ever want to reach me, if you have any questions about the program, if you have ideas about what we could teach, um, if you have ideas about programming we could have for the community, for clinicians, um, day-long seminars, whatever it is, please get in touch. We're always excited to hear from you. Um, enjoy the session, um, and thank you so much again. Mm. Thanks. Mm. Mm. Thanks so much, Bonnie, and, and thank you so much uh, to the New School for uh, sponsoring this event and this space, um, and as I mentioned to Abu and Bethany for helping behind the scenes with the important technology piece. Um, my name is Jonathan Kaplan. Professionally, I work as a clinical psychologist uh, here in New York City, where I own and direct the SOHO CBT and Mindfulness Center. I also teach here at the New School as an adjunct, um, I think for about 12 or 13 years, uh, a course on mindfulness and meditation and psychology. So if you're interested, like feel free to enroll. It's starting up in the spring semester. And if you need permission to join, just reach out to me and I can make that happen. Um, personally, I should mention that I hold many privileged identities and intersectionalities. I identify as white, cisgendered, heterosexual, able-bodied. I also identify as the father of two biracial boys. And I have two more marginalized identities that I am not going to discuss tonight um, in a public forum. And I also recognize that because they are not visible, that is something that I have the luxury and privilege to hold to myself, where folks from other marginalized identities do not have that ability. Um, so while I do work uh, to undo and become aware of my personal prejudices and biases, I, of course, have blind spots, um, sort of if and when they show up tonight. Um, I would ask for your patience and understanding with that, and also invite you to call me in and address it with me, like hopefully at the end today, because we're starting a little late and I'm already feeling a little pressed for time, uh, but it's something that you feel is important to raise in the middle. We can do that too, okay. um, Let's see. So, all right. Um, I'm gonna pass out some paper. If you could take a piece. So for the folks at home, what I'd like for you to do is to find a piece of paper and a pen. And ideally, if you're in a space where you can do this, I would like for you to make yourself visible uh, on the Zoom link. Um, if, you're, if you're not able to do so, that's fine. Uh, you do not have to unmute yourself, just make yourself visible. And uh, if you're able to uh, pull on the, what is it, the gallery view, so you can see other folks that are present online. Now, for this piece of paper, what I'd like for you to do is to uh, think of something that you have struggled with most in your life. Now, this is something that is specific to you. It's not the world. It's not other people. Uh, it might be some kind of internal judgment or self-criticism. Maybe it's like thinking that you're not good enough, for example. 
Uh, it might be uh, some kind of lack or excess of behavior, like maybe emotional eating, uh, or it might be some kind of personality trait or physical characteristic. So thinking about the thing that you have struggled with most in your life, and I'd like, this is for your eyes only on this piece of paper. I'd like for you to write it down. You can use initials or code. This is going nowhere but for you, okay? Is it clear? Thing you've struggled most with in your life. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Checking out folks online. Okay. So uh, with this thing that you've struggled with most in your life, this internal characteristic of yours, I'd like for you to sort of fold it up. You can ball it up if that's how you feel about it. You're going to hold it in your hand, and you're going to raise your hand high. Okay. So the folks at home playing along, uh, you have your hands up too, yeah? So hopefully you have your, your cameras off if you're able to and looking at the other folks on, on Zoom. Um, okay, this thing that you've struggled with most in your life, uh, if this has showed up for the very first time this week, you can put your hand down. So prior to this week, it didn't exist. Okay, what about over the past month? Uh, it first showed up over the past month, didn't exist prior. Okay, I'm seeing hands still up. Um, all right, let's take it out a little bit. Past year, the thing that you have struggled with most in your life first showed up this past year and didn't exist prior to that. If so, you can put your hand down. Past two years, you can put your hand down if it showed up within that. Five years, you put your hand down. 10 years, if it didn't exist prior to the past 10 years, you can put your hand down. Okay, so take a look around, whether it's in this room or whether it's online, and notice perhaps how many of us still have our hands up. <laughs> <laughs> So if things that we struggle with, pain and suffering, were not normal, and if it was so easy to get rid of, then our, pain, our hands wouldn't be up. So what this points to is not just the ubiquity of things that are painful and difficult for us, but the, the importance of cultivating acceptance around these issues, which is what I'll be talking about tonight. Okay, so you got your arm work out. You can put your, put your hand down. Piece of paper, you can rip up. You can eat it if you are so inclined and needing the extra fiber, whatever works for you. All right. Um, so tonight I'll be talking about acceptance. I will briefly uh, review some religious perspectives on um, acceptance, but mostly focusing in on um, acceptance and commitment therapy and how acceptance is realized within that. So acceptance and commitment therapy is abbreviated by ACT. However, it's typically sounded out, and, and that's what I'll be doing tonight. So instead of referring to it as ACT, I'll just be saying ACT the entire time. So just know that when I do that, it refers to acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, okay, um, I should say, uh, as I'm poised to talk about acceptance and religion, that I am in fact a psychologist, not a theologian. So um, as I'm covering some of these religions, uh, if you are a follower of any of these faiths or uh, a religious figure in any of these communities, I respectfully defer to your expertise in these areas. I'm presenting my understanding of how acceptance shows up in these religions um, and, 
and how it's considered from, from these different perspectives. The first thing I'm gonna review some theistic ones. So within Christianity, there's a sense of, of pain and difficulties and um, we are encouraged to find God within the pain and difficulties or and or use it as an opportunity to have faith in God or in God's plan. And so it serves a purpose to reaffirm one's faith. Within Judaism, uh, pain and suffering uh, for us might be punishment for our wrongdoing, might be a test of faith. These are very Old Testament ideas. Um, it might also just simply be a reflection of our human condition. And within this, we're encouraged to, to reach out to God, to find God, to seek support from God in dealing with these difficulties. Within Islam, there's two concepts that come up. The first is sabr, uh, where we're encouraged to have patience, endurance, and self-restraint when dealing with difficulties and pain and suffering. And the other is dikr, which encourages a fundamental remembrance of Allah. My understanding is that this is a central, central point of Islam and encouraging us to have engagement with our values and considering long-term consequences and perspectives relative to perhaps uh, immediate suffering and difficulties. Now, if these are the theistic religions, there's a couple non-theistic ones uh, Taoism and Buddhism. Within Taoism, uh, we're encouraged to believe and get in touch with the fact that there's a natural flow to the universe. And this is not something that's been put in place by some sort of uh, divine sentient being, but rather it's simply a reflection of the natural and cosmological operations of, of the universe. And from that perspective, uh, we're encouraged to relax into the, that natural flow of things and knowing that there's a certain order. It means, of course, that there might be certain things that um, we can't control or we might have limitations. And we are encouraged to accept that just as water might sometimes meet a rock. <laughs> the rock is there and the water can't do much about it other than perhaps wait for an opportunity to move. Uh, there's also a concept called uwe, or non-doing, or um, non-attached responsiveness, which, which similarly encourages us to uh, recognize when there's nothing else that we can do. And it's just a matter at that point of, allowing for things to unfold. So while it's not a natural example, uh, it might be a good one perhaps and sort of seeing like if we're stuck in traffic on the highway, right? Like Google Maps might show us like, oh, if we go this way and get off on this ramp and then immediately get back on this ramp, there could be ways to maybe inch along a little bit. Uh, but this would really encourage us to just wait it out. Right, we've done what we can. From a Buddhist perspective, uh, the first two noble truths point to the importance of acceptance. The first noble truth uh, that suffering exists, uh, noble truth of existence from a Buddhist perspective, um, that pain and suffering are natural, they are part of the human condition. And the second is that there is a cause uh, for our suffering, in particular attachment, i.e. non-acceptance, or from a Buddhist perspective, what's often framed as um, greed, hatred, and delusion. Now, what are the takeaways as we look at, at these religious perspectives? There's two that I wanna to point to that contrast with act or acceptance and commitment therapy. The first is that acceptance is baked into the religious experience whether it's from a theistic perspective or a non-theistic perspective, 
that worldview uh, is encouraged as part of our uh, ability to accept whatever it is that we're dealing with, right? So, so in other words, we need to believe in something or have faith in something as part of, of that religion. Second thing is that acceptance is often applied to external circumstances, right? How do I accept um, the existence of racism? in the world? How do I accept that children are born into poverty? How do I accept that um, bad things happen to good people? And so in that way, acceptance is looking outside of us to what's happening in the world. Now, ACT is different. Um, first thing is that ACT doesn't invite us to believe in anything. You don't have to believe in anything. Uh, and in fact, it's very flexible in that way. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but essentially, from an ACT perspective, um, what's true is what works. So it's very much focused on pragmatism, very much focused on what's helpful. So if you have a particular belief that promotes acceptance, great, run with it. Right? <laughs> Um, but you're not encouraged to adopt a particular belief or faith or perspective. Second, and this is where we're going to focus a lot tonight, is that the focus is on internal phenomena, not external events. So ACT has us find ways to deal with this, what we had in our hands, right? the things that we struggle with. How can we do that? If we could easily change it, hands would be down. Okay? So maybe we need to find ways internally to relate to these things a bit better, make things a bit easier. So far, so good. Um, so I'll give a brief overview of, of ACT and then we'll, we'll launch into acceptance more specifically. So ACT or acceptance and commitment therapy is what's considered to be a third wave of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, the, the first wave was behaviorism. The second wave was uh, a cognitive component characterized by Aaron Beck and uh, Albert Ellis. And the third wave of CBT specifically includes acceptance as, as part of its um, uh, development. The acceptance and commitment therapy was developed in 99 by Stephen Hayes, Kirk Strassel, and Kelly Wilson. Um, the, it's a process-based approach to therapy. So we're moving from religion into psychotherapy now, right? Which might be its own form of religion for us here in the West yeah. or in New York City <laughs> or here at the New School, right? That's a whole nother thing, right? That is not the topic of tonight's talk, <laughs> but it could be another one, note to self. Um, okay, process-based approach to therapy. What does that mean? What that means is that uh, ACT is not hooked on any one particular technique or method, that it is really concerned with the function of behavior uh, and interventions and strategies and skills. And it tries to balance these two perspectives of both change and acceptance, right? So what is it that I might be able to do in order to heal and grow? And for those things that are more difficult or aren't amenable to change, how can I find ways to accept or allow for those experiences? Um, easy way to think about change and acceptance. We might be able to apply if you have a partner or partners, right? It's like, oh, there's things I love about them. Great. Oh, but that, <laughs> right? Um, of course, we're being perceived in the same way, right? So know that. It's not just them. It's us, too. Uh, so ACT promotes acceptance and contrasts it with avoidance. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. This is one of the, the key principles of ACT, in that for many of us, 
these things that are painful, doo -doo 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 -doo, we try to avoid in various ways, right? To the best we can, right? What might that look like, right? If I'm feeling really anxious about something, how might I try to avoid that anxiety? Well, I might avoid whatever activates it, right? If I'm anxious about going to a party because I'm anxious socially, maybe I don't go to the party, right? Or if I do go and I have that anxiety, what can I do? Drink, <laughs> right? Very effective short-term way to reduce anxiety is drinking alcohol, right? Both of those strategies are me trying to avoid that experience of anxiety as opposed to finding ways to actually allow for it, to accept it, to exist with it. Um, ACT also will emphasize the problem of language, problem of language. And the, the next talk by Dr. DeRosha will be going uh, into this in depth as part of the ACT and process series. So you should come to that one. It's gonna be awesome and dig into this. Um, essentially what this refers to is that language for us is awesome, right? We have this wonderful prefrontal cortex here that no other species on the planet has. It allows us to uh, build bridges, iPhones, um, give talks, right? Create all kinds of things. Um, it also can cause us problems and that through this, we can oh, think poorly about ourselves. We can make negative judgments about ourselves and others, right? And this is something that we don't see in, in other areas of the animal world. As far as we know, squirrels are not out there in the park <laughs> comparing the bushiness of their tails to each other, right? If only my tail was as bushy as that squirrel, then I'd be it. Like we do that, <laughs> right? But they do not, right? Oh, to be a squirrel. Um, so, so in that respect, language can cause us problems. One of the things that I see often as a psychologist are variations of the I'm not good enough theme. Um, I don't know if any of us had that up here, but I see that one a lot. Um, and that can make it difficult for us to experience the world directly and also promote avoidance. Yeah, hi. Um, so I know um, CBT um, better. And so I'm wondering in, in ACT where somatic processes come in, mm -hmm. because I think in my own experience with CBT and myself, I have that 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 the somatic part actually was very helpful. So is it embedded in one of these other frames here or is that? Yeah, so, so the question is, is there a role for somatic parts uh, within ACT? And we're actually gonna be doing some of that later on tonight. Um, simple answer to that is that um, ACT doesn't, um, ACT is very flexible when it comes to technique and methods and processes. It's the function that it serves that matters. So what that means is that if using some sort of somatic approach is helpful in promoting one of the ACT processes, then, then somebody might do it, right? And we're actually gonna do one tonight around that. Um, yeah. Would that mean that it would be a type of approach that could be defined like um, it's, it's certainly client affirming. Um, what do you mean by client centered? Well, what are you struggling with? Hmm. What would you like to talk with and what would? It's that one. that one. What works, what's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so that might be something that, um, somebody is down for might be something that they're not. And if they're not down for, obviously it's not going to work. So you wouldn't do that. Right. Um, so I suppose in that way, you can consider it client-centered. Um, typically, like that, to me, that refers to more Rogerian-based psychotherapies, but, but it certainly can, can be applied here. So I wanted to give you a, a little overview of the ACT model 
we're going to be zeroing in on this quadrant in a little bit. Uh, so this is a wonderful model that's referred to affectionately as the ACT hexaflex. <laughs> And there are six processes. Um, you know, for those of you that were fortunate enough to attend Abu's uh, presentation last time, he went over these six processes. Um, acceptance, diffusion. This is how do we get unhooked from our thinking. Um, contact with the present moment, i.e. mindfulness. Um, Self as context, which essentially refers to uh, perspective taking and roles that we might adopt. Um, and uh, a very explicit articulation of personal values, what makes our life meaningful, and uh, making sure that we're able to act in accordance with that. Right? So oftentimes this gets in our way and makes it hard for us to actually do things that matter to us. And all of that is really to encourage psychological flexibility. So the main reason that uh, folks come to me typically is because they feel stuck, because they feel stuck about something. Maybe something like this, right? So ACT fundamentally is helping people get unstuck with this psychological flexibility. What does that mean? It means this, uh, contacting the present moment fully as a conscious historical human being. So accessing our uh, past context and based on what the situation affords, changing or persisting in behavior in the service of chosen values. So all of this means that we're able to show up with all of our stuff and be able to attend to what's in front of us in a way that's meaningful and consistent with what matters to us. Right? That's pretty good, right? <laughs> right? Doesn't mean getting rid of this. This is still with us. All right. um, okay. Now I mentioned experiential avoidance, uh, and I wanted to dig into that a little bit. So the experiential avoidance is when we're trying to avoid some aspect of our internal experience. Good luck with that. Okay. Um, what that means is that we might be trying to control or avoid distressing thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, images, things that we might call private experiences, which ultimately cannot be controlled or avoided. Now, sometimes short term, we can do that. We can do that. Um, and uh, it, it then actually can reinforce that cycle, right? So if I learned that if I go to a party, the best way for me not to feel anxious is to drink, and that works short term, what am I, what am I reinforced to do next time? Drink, maybe more, right? Of course, there might be long-term consequences, right? In terms of well, what happens to my wallet, what happens to my head, what happens to my decision-making, all of those things. Um, and that's one of the, the ways in which we get into trouble is being able to appreciate that the ways that we uh, avoid these issues can lead to long-term difficulties. Um, a metaphor that I use here sometimes is to, is to think about you know, whatever it is we're, we're struggling with as a beach ball. And if you imagine for a moment that you're in a pool, going, here's, here's this thing you don't want to deal with, anxiety, negative judgments, like bad feelings about yourself. And so the avoidance essentially is taking that beach ball and shoving it underwater. Yes. <laughs> All right. Surface. Cool, tranquil, right? Meanwhile, like I only got one arm free now, right? Because I'm busy keeping this at bay. And if you've ever actually done this in a pool, what eventually happens to that beach ball? Exactly. It like comes up and makes a big splashy mess, usually not where you're holding it down, right? It pops up somewhere else. And we're going like, what? 
like, well, see what happens, right? And then we have to be careful because our next action might be to run over and then do that again. And so with an act, what we're encouraged to do metaphorically is to slowly allow that beach ball to come up. Right? Now we're not taking it and like jamming it in our face. Well, that's a different kind of approach, right? <laughs> we're allowing it to surface, right? hands off. And sometimes that swimming pool current is gonna bring it close. Sometimes those feelings or thoughts might be strong. Sometimes it's gonna blow away, won't be there, right? And, and the invitation for us is to navigate that swimming pool, knowing that it is filled with beach balls, right? It's okay, it's okay. Right? Can we continue to, to swim or walk in the pool, even though these things will manifest in terms of our experience? Right? So far, so good. So here's a very blurry picture uh, from the, the um, uh, ACT archives. But what it, what it shows here essentially is a person that was going through their life. And then when things got difficult, they took an emotional avoidance detour, <laughs> which can go on and on and on and on, right? For years, right? <laughs> Um, before they, they get on the face. <laughs> Decades, years. Um, uh, so within ACT, you probably have a sense of this already, but I wanted to give you a, a formal definition. Uh, acceptance is the voluntary adoption of an intentionally open, receptive, flexible, and non-judgmental posture with respect to moment-to-moment -moment experience. So voluntary, intentional, open, receptive, flexible, non-judgmental to whatever is arising for us. Yeah. All right. If it's good, great. <laughs> if it's problematic or difficult, great that's the challenge right how do we open up to that um so a few things flow from that acceptance is a very active process it, it typically does not occur naturally to us these things are painful and sometimes very much and very intensely so and so it's very natural that we would try to avoid that but we can't very well, and especially long-term, they are gonna continue to resurface. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That um, one way to think of this perhaps is that we have a, an additive model of mind, and that if you think of something, whatever it might be, right, it's in there, right? And if you think of it again, it's in there, in there in there, in there. We can't take that out. We can't subtract that, right? So if we have negative judgments about ourselves, that's gonna be in there and we're gonna to have to contend with that in a, in a very active kind of way. Um, now, as I've been talking about, the focus is on internal experiences. So focused on painful, feelings, memories, images, thoughts, emotions, things like that. Okay. Not external world. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so, right. So, for example, um, for me and in, in seeing the ways in which um, I have racist programming in me, right, it's very painful and shameful to see that, right? Yet I have to be open to that in order to work with it. Right? Um, the, um, and sure, these things exist in the world too, right? But I also have to uh, work on how it's manifesting internally with me. Right? 
And, and especially in doing anti-racism work, like that's where that work starts, right? We have to start with that. Um, acceptance also doesn't mean liking or giving in. So we can try to find ways to accept for our experiences, allow for them. It's not passive resignation. It doesn't mean that we like what's going on. The example that I typically use with my classes is that um, if I were to turn my back, right, and one of you, I'm not saying who, were to suddenly put a bunch of thumbtacks on my chair, right, and I come back and I'm like, la, 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 boop, all the thumbtacks, right? Ow, incredibly painful. Acceptance doesn't mean that I just sit here <laughs> in it. <laughs> Right, have to feel the pain, but it doesn't mean that I just like give up and don't stand up or don't try to address it in some way. I need to acknowledge the pain. I'm certainly feeling it, right? Um, but I'm still able to take um, uh, some action there. And and finally, and this is an important one, is that um, acceptance is often helped by knowing that it's in the service of values, that it's in the service of values. Why should we allow for these things? Why should we? Because oftentimes it gets in the way of us showing up in the way that we want to in the world. Okay? So if we're struggling, for example, with, well, if I use myself as an example of feelings of guilt and shame related to, um, uh, racist programming, right? Like, why would I deal with that? Because it's important to me, right? In order for me to deal with promoting my values related to anti-racism or related to DEI, like it means that I'm gonna have to show up to that guilt, to that shame, to that sadness, that frustration. It's okay, does not feel good. I do not like. <laughs> it's important. It's that. So, um, just like these finger traps, there's a notion that we need to go into our psychological experiences in order to have some kind of freedom uh, versus pulling away. And, all right. Um, so let's get into the how. We've talked a lot about acceptance from religious perspectives, from act perspective. Let's like do some of this, yeah? So like, yay, let's do it. Uh, okay. So there's a few uh, exercises within ACT, and we'll do a somatic one here tonight. Um, but I wanted to point out uh, at least one other, and depending on the time, might might reference two more. Um, okay, so uh, tug of war with a monster. All right, so imagine for a moment that you are engaged in a tug of war with a monster who is bigger, stronger than you, more vicious and ferocious and prone to do horrible things. And you are got one end of the rope and the monster's pulling. And in between you is a bottomless pit. All right. And this monster, <laughs> it's, the, it's this stuff. It's fear. It's doubt. It's unworthiness. Uh, it's your anxiety. It's your sadness, your grief. It's your shame. It's all of that. How do you win? <laughs> what? Let what go? Yeah. What? <laughs> Drop the rope. <laughs> right? Right? Now, did the monster go away? No, monster's not in the pit. Right? They're there. What happened to all these things? They're still there. So what's changed? Not pulling you in. Not pulling you in. Right? Not, fight with it. not fighting, not struggling to get rid of these things. 
right? And that's, that's fundamental to the acceptance process. Like, how can I find a way to actually allow for these experiences, right? How can I find a way to drop this rope, knowing that these feelings are going to still persist? They're not going anywhere, right? In fact, they might even get bigger or louder right? or more dominant, at least short term. Um, yeah. So when it's created based on these opportunities to really stop, then if mm -hmm. the external thought comes into the mind thought or the external experience comes mm -hmm. to the external experience, like mm -hmm. thinking about like the monastery, mm -hmm. our poor housing laws, poor employment laws, and, and all those things, then you mm -hmm. do have to identify yourself through. Yes. Yes. And that's the distinction between internal versus external experiences, right? So, so if we take the example here of, um, what'd you say, poor housing laws, right? I'm saying, I mean, because those are external, they do become external. Hmm? How so? What do you mean by internal? Yes, yeah. And so when you know that there's poor housing laws, what does that prompt in you? want to fight back so i hear emotionally maybe there's some anger yeah hmm? yeah yeah what oh, it's a big question mark. oh okay so so the question is um how, what happens when this is external right when there's some some sort of external problem like poor housing laws right what do we do about that right. so act would focus on first perhaps the internal part right Maybe you feel angry. Right? What else might show up? It's you versus poor housing laws. What else might show up internally? Her desire to fight. Helplessness. It's helplessness. Right on. Right? Okay, so what do I do now? <laughs> mm -hmm. They go to bed mad. <laughs> Right? <laughs> it's like, no, no. Like, this is where we need to be able to, to feel these feelings, acknowledge them, be with them, and take some act action for the external circumstances, right? And whether it's poor housing laws or racism or whatever it might be, like, that's where the values come into play, right? There's things that are motivating us to take action. But if we are too overwhelmed with, say, feelings of helplessness or feelings of anger that we try to avoid in a way that actually doesn't help us address an external problem, that is not going to get us anywhere. And so it's a little bit of both, that if we're able to find ways to be with what's happening internally, we're perhaps better resourced to be able to address what's happening externally. Right? And I, I see this with a lot of folks that um, uh, that are active in, say, social justice circles, like looking at um, kind of what what emotions that they are cultivating and what values that are driving them. And then I see folks who can get burnt out from the rage and stress and anger. And the, the people that I see that, that seem to weather it a bit better are folks that in, are in touch with the value of a love or kindness or compassion as something that's motivating them to do this work. Right? Now, that's not to say that like rage and anger isn't helpful, because oftentimes it can be, especially in, in promoting social justice causes and other things, um, which is why I think it, it takes all of us to do things, right? Not just one. But I, I, I don't want to suggest at all that the acceptance here means that we just kind of roll over and be like, ah, oh, poor housing laws, oh well, <laughs> right? Or, oh, racism, oh well, homophobia, oh well. It's like, no, no, those are gonna activate feelings and thoughts and all that, like, and you have the thought of what difference can I make? Well, if you, you get hooked by that thought, you believe that thought, it can stop you from doing anything, right? So how can you accept the fact that that thought might come to mind and 
motivated by love or motivated by a sense of justice or equality or whatever it might be, you're still going to act in the external world. Does that make sense? Yeah. Have I talked too much about this? <laughs> all right. Um, all right. We're checking out the time. All right. So we'll do a, an acceptance exercise tonight. And this is my favorite one. And it's uh, a somatic one. Has anybody here heard of the, the range approach? Yes, I heard of that. Yes, you've heard of the range approach. Is it the power of breath or huh? is she the version? Uh, she, she popularized she it. Popularized yeah, it. it did not originate with her. Yeah. Sorry that I need to leave the film screen now in fashion, but I'm going okay. to play the kids. Awesome. This is amazing. I've taken photos of this before. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everyone. yeah, no deep fakes, please. Amazing hair. Yep. <laughs> All right. Thanks, honey. No deep fakes with the photos. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, so we'll have a chance to practice this tonight. It seems like people are familiar with this, which is nice. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, you are in for a treat. Uh, and if you are, it's like, yay, you get a little more practice. Okay. So I'll review what this technique is uh, as an acceptance exercise, and then we'll do it together. So RAIN is an acronym for Recognize, Allow, Investigate, and Nurture. And how we practice is this. Um, first step is recognizing what shows up in the body is that somatic piece, right? And in particular, if we're having Difficult thoughts, difficult feelings, how is it manifesting in the body? And I'll take us all through this in a moment. So, um, and we wanna do a deep dive into the physical sensations. Second part is allowing for those sensations, those feelings in the body. Now, um, some people are able to just do that, like flipping a switch. I don't understand how people can do that, but I have met those folks. They do exist. I am not one of them. So you'll have to do it my way, which is um, that I don't have a switch for allowing for things. So instead, uh, I'll take us through. If you have the switch, use it. Right? But if you don't, then what we'll do is, is have um, an opportunity to, to practice in saying yes, towards what it is that we're feeling or what it is that we're noticing, right? Again, it doesn't mean that we like it, right? We'll get into that in this exercise. It's here. Yes, it is. Right. Um, oh, I think I'm about to go off camera. Um, but it's a little bit like, sometimes we have like, thoughts, feelings that are trying to get our attention, right? On one side of the door. And we are trying to make sure that they don't come in. So through this, we're gonna open the door, they're gonna come in, and we're gonna say, yep, you're here, all right. Yep, you were here anyway, right? But now you're in. Um, so recognize and allow. Investigate. Sometimes as we do this exercise, um, these, these feelings go away. They will pass and they will subside. So what we are trying to keep out will come in and then leave, right? Sometimes that's what happens. Um, sometimes it doesn't. Feeling sticks around, or the thought, image, memory, whatever it is. When that happens, um, we can ask feel, we can ask some questions related to where we're feeling it most in the body, and see. Maybe something comes up. Maybe it doesn't. Um, what we're looking for at this point is an answer from the body, not the head. Okay? And sometimes that happens. Sometimes it doesn't. So I'll take us through this piece today. And, um, and then the final stage is, is 
being able to practice a bit of kindness or self-compassion in whatever way is, is most available to us to recognize that we just like deliberately like invited in something difficult to work with. Okay. Um, sometimes folks just do the beginning part, right? Recognize and allow and the feeling went away and that's it. That's fine. That's fine. Um, all right, should we do a little practice? You guys up? Cool, yeah. <laughs> Daniel, you think I'm pointing at you. <laughs> like, ah! <laughs> um, okay, so it'll be a bit of a, a meditation experience. Uh, you can listen to me, I will guide you through this. Um, so if you still have questions about what this is or what this looks like, they will soon be answered as we go through this. Okay. And before we begin, um, I'd like for you to think of something that happened over the past week that is mildly to moderately upsetting for you. Nothing traumatic, nothing big, not, not this, okay? <laughs> this is a, a workshop exercise, not an in-depth therapy session, okay? So I'm trusting you all to use your discernment to know what is difficult but not overwhelming, okay? So maybe this is an argument you had with somebody. Maybe it was, I don't know, getting a ticket because you didn't move your car for street cleaning, <laughs> whatever it is, right? Something like that. Um, but it's not this one. Guys got that. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do is have us um, first roll around in that in that experience. So whatever happened over the past week that was sort of minorly to moderately upsetting, maybe it triggered some anxiety, some stress, some anger, sadness, whatever it is. Okay, um, you all ready? Start. Okay, um, so if I can invite you to adopt a posture where you're sitting, and, and for the folks on, online, you can turn your cameras off if that helps you feel more, more comfortable. Uh, they might already be off and that's fine. And if you feel comfortable, I'd invite you to close your eyes as it will make it a little bit easier for you to concentrate. Um, if not, you can keep your eyes open, but just sort of looking down words in front of you. And in terms of your posture, adopting a position that is both relaxed and alert. So not too rigid and not too loose. And in this space, taking a few deep breaths. As you start to direct your attention inwards. Perhaps feeling the torso expand with air as you breathe in. And then contract as you breathe out. very gently bringing to mind this incident or experience over the past week that was slightly or moderately upsetting. And in your mind, going back to that experience,
and remembering where you were. Who you were with. Remembering what happened, maybe what you said or what someone else said to And for a few moments here, really inviting yourself to relive the memory of that experience. It's unpleasant, I know. It's okay. Remembering in particular what upset you and how that upset manifested, maybe as an emotion or feeling, thoughts you were having. Seeing if you can rekindle some of that feeling that you had then, right here and now. Maybe it prompted anger or anxiety or sadness, shame, guilt. Whatever it was, see if you can invite that feeling to show up now. Maybe you can feel some of that feeling, maybe not. If you can, I'd like for you to focus on where that feeling shows up in the body. So if it's anxiety, where do you feel it most prominently in the body right now in this moment? If it's anger, where is that most prominently right now? Whatever the feeling was. Taking a moment to focus on where you feel it most prominently in the body in this moment, right now, right here. And once you've identified how it's showing up for you physically in this moment, directing your attention to that physical sensation. And seeing what you notice about it. Perhaps initially tracing the edges of that sensation. For example, if you're feeling 
tension in your chest. At some point, that feeling might fade away. Maybe you don't feel that tension in your neck or abdomen. So noticing the boundaries or edges of that feeling. And what else do you notice about this physical sensation right now? Is it hot? Is it cold? Does it feel pressured or heavy? Is it painful? Does it hurt? Is there any dynamic quality to it or is it fairly static? There's the feeling of movement. How would you describe that movement? Is it a gripping, a churning, a bubbling, a burning? And really noticing how this feeling shows up for you physically in the body. Describing the feeling to yourself. And as you're noticing these physical sensations, gently giving permission for these sensations to be present by saying yes to whatever it is you're noticing. So in your mind, it might sound something like this. Yes, I feel tension in my chest. Yes, it feels hot. Yes, it feels like a gripping sensation. Yes, it's stretching across my torso. And you can say yes to whatever else shows up as well. If you have other thoughts, you can say yes to those too. Often, often also can say yes to your own reactions. Yes, I don't like this feeling. Yes, I wish it would go away. Yes, this is painful. And in this way, inviting yourself to say yes to the parts of you that say no.
yes to whatever it is you're noticing. And as you're doing this, that feeling in the body, it might have subsided. Maybe it didn't show up at all. It's fine. But still present for you. I'd like for you to ask that feeling a question. So directing a question to that feeling in the body. And that question is, how can I help? How can I help? And maybe an answer bubbles up from that place in the body, maybe it doesn't. Either way is fine. And as we near the end of this exercise, taking a few moments here to extend yourself some kindness or love or compassion for doing something that's difficult, for inviting an unpleasant experience, unpleasant feeling or memory. You might Have some gesture, hand over the heart and the chest or hands together. Some way of providing some support, nurturing yourself for this experience. And whenever you're ready, your eyes are closed, you can gently open them, returning with your full presence and awareness. What did folks notice? You don't have to share, but thoughts, questions, reactions. So I had never thought to ask myself how can I help consciously, which mm. is like a very spiritual uh, I think that would help. Mm-hmm. All right. So, so being able to ask yourself explicitly, like, how can I help? Um, might provide some kind of some some support. Yeah. Nice, nice. And typically, when when I run through this with folks, um, the I I try to see if if that if there's a reply, if it comes from that part of the body, it sounds a little trippy, right? As opposed to it being like well, I think that there's like eight ways that I could help. First is like very heady kind of response, right? Which is fine, which is fine. But what this, this process is trying to get us to do is to practice acceptance in an embodied way, right? By using a somatic technique, right? 
let's come into what's going on in the body. If I'm thinking that I'm not good enough, what's going on in the body? If I'm thinking, you know, what difference can I make to deal with, um, you know, poor housing conditions? What's going on in the body? And being able to direct our attention there to allow for that, that feeling, the way that these thoughts, images, memories, emotions, feelings, the way that they show up and manifest for us. Yeah. Um, and this is something, today we did it a little bit artificially, right? Inviting you to try to conjure something. Usually when I do this with folks, you know, some people like were able to get something and some people aren't, right? It's like, you know, we open the door, like, all right, feeling, come on in. And there's no feeling there. <laughs> like, okay. Sometimes it's like that, right? Don't worry though, because it'll come back, <laughs> right? It has a, has a frequent flyer card on your, on your psyche, right? Um, yeah, there you go. And when I use this um, in, in the context of therapy, um, I, I usually do it not to artificially conjure something, but when it's actually present, right? So it's like, oh, it's come up, it's manifest. And let's go into that, if you're willing. Right? So a couple other things I'll mention before we end. Um, so a couple other acceptance exercises that are, are popular within ACT. Um, some folks, if it resonates with them uh, in terms of their own religious or spiritual beliefs, will use the serenity prayer. Um, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, I find it, it's helpful to make a distinction sometimes between wanting and willing. Um, and again, this, this gets at kind of the, the role of values in terms of acceptance. So if I asked you, um, I don't know, do you want to take a cold shower tomorrow morning? <laughs> like really cold, ice cold. No, you don't. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. What if, I don't know, what if tomorrow you had an important job interview and the heat had gone out in your building or your house um, in order to show up to that interview uh, clean and well presented, would you be willing to take a cold shower? I'm seeing more nods, not all, <laughs> but more. Right. So it's that it's that distinction, the wanting, the willing. Right. Like, do I want that? No. Am I willing to do it? Maybe. Right? Maybe yes. Or maybe it's still no. No, I am showing up dirty to that interview and take me as I am. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. So ultimately, uh, we have this this question that when we're confronted with feelings that we have that we consider to be unacceptable, um, what we want to do is, is ultimately have a choice. Do we find ways to accept those feelings or are we here rejecting them or out in this, this realm of experiential avoidance from an ACT perspective? Um, I see we're nearing the end of our time. So if you're hungry for more ACT, and, and I realize, and showing this photo of the dog licking the grill. I should say that the grill is cold. This is not a hot grill. <laughs> so the dog has not been harmed in the taking of this photo. Um, so there's a couple websites. Uh, contextualscience.org is the website for the International ACT community uh, for the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. We have a, a New York City chapter here and we have a brand new website um, that that replaced the old one. So you can go there and just marvel at its brilliance and style. Uh, there's, of course, ACT books, ACT articles, uh, TED Talks. Um, and uh, if you're really into this, you can come to the next ACT in Process lecture. 
that's coming up uh, next month, January 10th, in this room and on this link, hopefully. <laughs> Yes. We just dropped the we dropped yeah. the yeah. image. Or we, yeah. we just dropped the flyer. So. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, so it'll be same time, six to seven thirty, with Dr. DeRosha, and she will do a great job, I'm sure, of talking to you all about what cognitive diffusion is. How do we get unhooked from this stuff? Right. You know, especially when we can't change it. Sometimes I find that no matter how much we try to tell ourselves differently, the old stuff still keeps coming back. So what do we do? Tune in next month. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, any questions or not? Or thank you all for being here. Don't know if there's any online questions or not. Or... There was a, a comment huh. oh. online from huh. Emily Martin. Huh. Really appreciate the somatic exercise. Huh. I imagine this technique can be helpful for those who have very huh. active, negative, shaming self-talk. I've invited patients to name and externalize that huh. story in their head. Uh -huh. But this is a nice way to try out a gentler voice, huh. which asks what the pain slash feeling means. Huh. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Glad it, glad it can be helpful, right? And And finding that you know, especially within the field of psychotherapy, it's it's moving to more somatic and body-based exercises, and and this is a nice way to do that. Um, yeah, and I highly recommend it if you have the need or want. Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Ooh, stickers stickers that's a bonus for coming in person if you if you can not everybody can it's, yeah oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah hold on i'm gonna back i'm gonna unmic my Bye. Thank you. <laughs>